Chapter 7 The Later History of the Nile Valley The First Intermediate Period After the fall of the Old Kingdom, the public monuments were plundered. Temples were violated, tombs were pillaged, statues were shattered, and the central economy collapsed. This period of chaos is generally called the First Intermediate Period. During this time, Nomarchs organized raids on other regions to plunder food. Peasants were forced to arm themselves. The middle classes, by contrast, lived in the relative safety of their walled residences. In the midst of the upheaval, a new literature developed. It was quite unlike the old mortuary literature and biographies. These works, on the social and political turmoil, became classics to be studied at school in much later pharaonic periods when stability returned. The Adamitians of Ipuer, for example, describes the revolt of the poor and the invasions from Asia. A man regards his son as his enemy. The tribes of the desert have become Kimites, i.e. Egyptians, everywhere. What the ancestors foretold has arrived at fruition. The land is full of confederates, and a man goes to plow with his shield. Indeed, hearts are violent, pestilence is everywhere, blood is throughout the land, death is not lacking, and the mummy cloth speaks even before one comes near it. Indeed, the land turns round like a potter's wheel. The robber is possessor of riches, and a rich man has become a plunderer. Barbarians from abroad have come to commit. Those who were commites have become foreigners and are thrust aside, and the man of the rank can no longer be distinguished from him who is nobody. All is ruined. There was also developments in sacred literature. The coffin texts were partly restatement of the pyramid texts, but with new developments added. Preserved on wooden coffins, their function was to accompany the dead person with all the spells they would need in their journey throughout the afterlife. In 4188 BC, a group of oligarchs tried to establish hegemony over the city of Memphis. Manetho identifies these rulers as the Egyptian 7th dynasty. According to Africanus, 70 kings ruled in 70 days. Doubtless an exaggeration, but it highlights the extent of political instability. Eusebius, another scholar, records Manetho as saying that this dynasty consisted of four kings that ruled in 75 days. This seems far more believable to us. The 8th dynasty also ruled from Memphis. Consisting of 27 kings, they ruled for 146 years, 4188 to 4042 BC. The 9th dynasty, 4042 to 3633 BC, ruled from Heracleopolis, as did the 10th dynasty, 3633 to 3448 BC, that followed them. The latter dynasty built modest-sized pyramids at Saqqara. Of the 38 rulers of the two dynasties, the best acknowledged today are Kedi I, Kedi II, Nefakare, Kedi VII, and Merikare, all the 9th dynasty. Pharaoh Kedi VII wrote the famous instruction of Mekare. For Merikare, his young son, it advised the young man on how to be a good ruler when he inherited the throne. A reading of this text shows that the stability had certainly been achieved during this period. Pharaonic hegemony was firmly established from Thinis in the south to the Mediterranean in the north. The text describes conflicts with the Libyans in the western delta and the Benduins of the eastern delta, but this is no different to the problems faced by the earlier kings. The lands to the south of Thinis, it seems, belong to Cush. This document, in any case, refutes the notion fashionable among current historians and Egyptologists that Egypt at this time was in total chaos, ruled by simultaneous dynasties. The Heracleopolians stayed in power until 3448 BC, but a rival dynasty did in fact arise to challenge them. These rivals ruled from the southern city of Waset. Little seems to be known about Mentuhotep I, the founder of the rival 11th dynasty. In 3548 BC, Antef I succeeded him. Antef II was the first ruler of Waset to assume the full insignia of royalty. His forces challenged the power of Heracleopians to the north, probably making Tefebi the northern boundary. He seized the city of Abydos and the entire Thinite Nome to the south, extending his power to the first cataract. After a distinguished rule of nearly 50 years, his son succeeded him. Middle Kingdom Egypt A successor ruler, Mentuhotep II, completed the reunification of Egypt after finally defeating his Heracopolitan rivals and expelling the troublesome Asiatic element. This marks the beginning of the Middle Kingdom. 
Waset was now established as the capital. Mentuhotep II ruled for 51 years. During his career, he created the office of overseer of Lower Egypt, his ships sailed to Byblos to collect wood, and monuments were built in Upper Egypt. The mortuary temple in Dera Bari combined a rock-cut tomb with a pyramid tomb. Also built were rock-cut tombs for his important officials. At a much later period, his mortuary temple inspired Pharaoh Hatshepsut to build her temple, currently one of Egypt's most celebrated monuments. Mentuhotep III ascended the throne in 3424 BC. He built monuments in the Delta. One of his officials made an expedition to Punt. During the period of his successor, Mentuhotep IV, quarrying was resumed in Hamamat. Some 10,000 men were recruited to work in this region from all over the country. We are informed from an inscription that during this campaign, my soldiers returned without loss. Not a man perished, not a troop was missing, not an ass died, not a workman was enfeebled. This king, however, seems to have been an effectual ruler who failed to check the growing power of the nomarchs. Some of the problems of decentralization associated with Pepi II re-emerged. Amenemhet I was of nomarchy of Elephantine. At first he was the prime minister of Men Mentuhotep IV, but overthrew him in 3405 BC. He moved the royal residence to a site near the modern town of Elist, near Memphis. Returning to old ideas, he built a mortuary temple of fluted columns. He also erected a pyramid. Rising to a lofty 352 feet, it was the largest built since the 5th dynasty. His officials were buried nearby in Mastabas. Waset remained the center of Amun worship. In this city, he built the statues and altar in the Temple of Amun in Luxor. In the Nubian cities of Buhen and Wawat, he built great castles with walls 16 feet thick and nearly 30 feet high. These monuments guarded Egyptian control over the Nubian gold mines and quarries. In the eastern delta, he built fortification to secure routes to the Sinai Peninsula. This led to Egyptian control of the copper and turquoise mines. Amun Nemhet I, however, was unable to secure the western border with Libya. He thus resorted to occasional campaigns to deal with this element. The king's palace was astonishing, a veritable fever of the gods. Its door was overlaid with sheet copper fitted with bolts of bronze. The floors were inlaid with silver. Its walls were embellished with gold leaf. The roof was made of sycamore. Finally, lapis lazuli decorated its ceilings. Canon Rawlinson was the Camden Professor of Ancient History at the University of Oxford. He was very impressed by the 12th Dynasty and wrote the following precise of the achievements. The wise rulers of the time devoted their energies and their resources, not, as the earlier kings, to piling up undying memorials of themselves in the shape of monuments that reach to the heaven but to useful works, to the excavation of wells and reservoirs, the making of roads, the encouragement of commerce, and the development of vast agriculture wealth of the country. They also diligently guarded the frontiers, chastised aggressive tribes, and checked invasion by the establishment of strong fortresses in positions of importance. They patronized art, employing themselves in building temples rather than tombs, and adorned their temples not only with reliefs and statues, but also with the novel architectural embellishment of the obelisk, a delicate form, and one especially suited to the country. Before the 12th dynasty period, historians know of only two organized states of, on the planet Earth, Nubia and Egypt. During the 12th dynasty period, states would appear for the first time in Asia. Of these, Sumer, located in modern Iraq, emerged first around 3300 BC. It was quickly followed by Elam, located in modern Iran, Akkad in Iraq and Syria, and then the Indus Valley Civilization in western India and Pakistan. With the controversial exception of Crete, there were no other known civilizations on the planet Earth at this date. There are, however, historians from the British Isles who claim that Stonehenge and other various structures built in Ireland and northern Scotland deserve consideration as evidence of very early civilization in Europe. According to Dr. Hornung, Senwar Set I, 3376 to 3331 BC, would be first surpassed as an architect only by the great kings of Dynasty 18. He built the kiosk of Amun in Karnak. It was a fine building with finely executed reliefs of reused blocks. He commissioned the Temple of Ra in Heliopolis, where he added two red granite obelisks. In Abydos, he constructed important buildings. In the country of Wawat, far to the south, he completed the colonization. He built the castles of Kuban and Aniba. His armies penetrated Kushite territory. 
In year 38 of his reign, Amani, his herald, led a force of 17,000 men to carry 150 statues and 60 sphinxes as part of the royal construction program. Donkeys were used as beasts of burden. Amun Nemehet II, the following king, came to power in 3331 BC. He built a shrine to Hathor in Sinai and the White Pyramid of Dashur. From the period, trade goods were discovered among the treasures of Tod. Archaeologists found four copper chests in the foundations of the Temple of Manitou at Tod near Waset. In the chests were precious metals and stones, and also works of art from Sumer and Crete. Also found were cylinder seals from the third Sumerian dynasty of Ur. This evidence may indicate that Amun Nemehet II period was contemporaneous with Ur Dynasty III, but this is controversial and we will discuss this issue later in the chapter. Unfortunately, however, slave trading was going on at this time, to cite Professor Hornung once more. Unlike the Old Kingdom, we can distinguish a brisk trade in slaves in this period. There were not enough military undertakings to explain the ever-growing number of Asiatic slaves in Egypt. Senwarsret II ruled over an eventful 19 years. He built dams and canals around Lake Morris to allow irrigation of the Fayum region. He erected a pyramid tomb near El Lahun. Nearby, he constructed Calhoun, a town of officials, priests, and workers. It had over 100 houses where even the smallest homes for people of the lowest rank had four to six rooms and an area of 1,022 square feet or larger. Excavations revealed that the city was the world's first known example of town planning. Cahoon was a rectangular and walled. Inside the city was divided into two parts. One part housed the wealthier inhabitants, the scribes, officials, and foremen. The other part housed the ordinary people. The streets of the western section in particular were straight, laid out on a grid, and crossed each other at right angles. A stone gutter over half a meter wide ran down the center of every street. Positioned to benefit from the cool north winds, five single-story mansions were found along the northern edge of the city. Their doorways were arched. Each boasted 70 rooms divided into four sections or quarters. There was a master's quarter, quarters for women and servants, quarters for offices, and finally, quarters for granaries, each facing a central courtyard. The master's quarters had an open court with a stone water tank for bathing. Surrounding this was a colonnade. Of the maze of rooms, some were barrel vaulted in brick, but others were wooden and thatched. The ceilings were supported by wooden and stone columns, some with polyform capitals. Lime wash coated the walls, but some rooms contained frescoes. Sen Wasret III had a long and illustrious career on the throne, ruling for 38 years. In Egypt, he undermined the power of nomarchs. In Wawat, he built a string of castles spread over a distance of 30 miles. Throughout Nubia, he was worshipped as a god. In Palestine, his armies marched, spreading Egyptian writing and the Egyptian calendar. Finally, on the cultural front, there were great developments of expressive portrait sculpture during this time. Amun Nemet III, the last great ruler of the dynasty, 3242 to 3195 BC, built two important pyramids at Hawara and Dashur. The former monument had a sepulchral chamber weighing a staggering 110 tons of yellow quartzite. He built a hall of granite pillars for Sobek. At Minet Madi, he built a temple to Renanutet, the goddess of harvest. At Hawara, he built the labyrinth with its massive layout, multiple courtyards, chambers, and halls. The very largest building in antiquity, he boasted 3,000 rooms. 1,500 were above ground and the other 1,500 were underground. Our old friend, Herodotus, saw it in ruins 3,000 years later. He was still somewhat impressed. I visited this place and found a to surpass description. For if all the walls and other great works of the Greeks could be put together in one, they would not equal, either for labor or expense, this labyrinth. And yet the Greek temple of Ephesus is a building worthy of note, and so is the temple of Samos. The pyramids likewise surpass description and are equal to number of the greatest works of the Greeks, but the labyrinth surpasses the pyramids. Amun Nemhet III's daughter, Nefrupta, had a rich burial. After this impressive period, Amenemhet IV ruled for nine years and was succeeded by Queen Regent Sebeni Ferura, the last ruler of the dynasty. This obscure reading spelled the end of the Middle Kingdom. The glory of the Mid Middle Kingdom, however, says a modern authority, had been firmly implanted in the Kemetic, i.e. Egyptian, consciousness and did not fade. 
Over the centuries, it was regarded as KMT's, i.e. Egypt's, classical period. The Second Intermediate Period The 13th dynasty began to rule in 3182 BC. Manetho tells us that it consisted of 60 kings of Waset that ruled for a lengthy 453 years. A period of great political upheaval, modern historians call this the Second Intermediate Period. The weakening of the pharaonic authority meant more power was concentrated into the hands of the viziers. In the far south, the castles of Buhen were burned. The Nubians became independent. Egypt's southern boundary returned to Elephantine. In the north, nomadic Semites infiltrated the eastern delta. These foreigners probably worshipped Baal, later to be identified with Set, the Nile Valley god of the south. The nomads built the city of Aaris. Asiatic slaves and freemen already in the country increased the numbers and influence of the Semites. Asians building pyramids at Dashur and Saqqara reflected the power. In time, the delta became independent under the Asian dynasty 14. They were the first white kings to rule any part of African territory. Manetho implies that it consisted of 76 kings, some of whom ruled independently for 184 years after the fall of Dynasty 13. We do not know the dates for the earliest kings, but they were contemporary with Dynasty 13, except ruling from the north. We can certainly deduce that the Asians ruled from 2729 BC, the date for the fall of the 13th Dynasty, until 2545 BC as the sole masters of Egypt. Modern Egyptologists, under the spell of Meyer and Breasted, tend to mystify and then dismiss this period as if it did not exist. However, Manetho claims 136 kings for dynasties 13 and 14. The royal papyrus of Turin, another Egyptian source, names 116 of them. Moreover, the time periods given by the papyrus, although fragmentary and in need of interpretation, corroborate Manetho. We shall discuss this in later chapter. In 2545 BC, Egypt was conquered by a new set of rulers, the Hyskos. Manetho informs us that a blast of God smote us, and unexpectedly from the regions of the east, invaders of obscure race marched in confidence of victory against our land. By main force, they easily seized it without striking a blow, and having overpowered the rulers of the land, they then burned our cities ruthlessly, and treated all the natives with cruel hostility, massacring some and leading into slavery the wives and children of others. Finally, they appointed as king one of their number whose name was Salidus. These conquerors of West Semitic origin dominated the lands for over 669 years, ruling as the 15th and 16th dynasties. We believe, however, that Manetho muddled the order of the dynasties, incorrectly placing dynasty 16 before 15. In our view, Salidus, named above, was actually the first king of the 16th dynasty. Dynasty 15 consisted of 32 Hiskos kings. 24 of these are named in a Greek language document called the Book of Sophists. We believe that the lengths of the reigns given by the source are overly generous, but the order is reliable. Dynasty 16, 1993 to 1709 BC, consisted of six rulers from Salidus to Ipepi. Of all the Hiskos kings, however, Kien and Ipepi were probably the most important. It should be noted, however, that the origin of the Hiskos remains controversial. Many writers echoing Josephus, the great Roman Jewish historian, identify them as the ancient Israelites. If this is true, then the Old Testament of the Bible is largely, if not completely, false. The Hiskos established their capital city at the Asian-dominated site of Avaris. Excavations reveal that it was nearly one square mile and had houses, tombs, palaces, and temples. A wall of mud bricks 26 feet thick surrounded the city. The buildings within the wall show some affinity with those of Canaan, or perhaps those of Western Asian. The position of Arvis allowed the Hiskos to control trade routes that led to the Mediterranean and the Middle East by the sea and by land. The conquering rulers made overtures to the Kingdom of Kush. They hoped to secure their southern border and also build trade links with the rest of Africa. However, some Egyptians, led by Second Renre Dao II, rebelled against them. Second Renre of the 17th dynasty began a war of liberation. The foreign rulers and had military advantages, however. With stronger chariots giving greater speed, they also had powerful weapons. The Hiskos possessed a new type of bow design that could fire over a much greater distance than an ordinarily wooden bow. Second Renre the Dao II died in battle. Camos succeeded him on the throne. A famous inscription written by Pharaoh Camos gives an account of his campaign against the elderly Hiskos king Ipepi. 
part of which reads as follows. Behold, I have come. I am successful. As the mighty Ammon endures, I will not leave you alone. I will not let you tread the fields without being upon you. O wicked of heart, vile Asiatic, I shall drink the wine of your vineyard. I lay waste your dwelling place. I cut down your trees. The Egyptians were worried about an alliance between the foreigners and the kingdom of Cush. The Camo Stella tells us that the Hiscos ruler of Egypt wrote a letter to the king of Cush, asking him to intervene in Egyptian affairs. Part of the letter reads as follows. He, i.e. Kamos, chose the two lands to persecute them, my land and yours, and he has ravaged them. Come navigate downstream, do not be afraid. Behold, he is here with me. There is no one who will be waiting for you in this Egypt, for I will not let him go until you have arrived. Then we shall divide the towns of this Egypt, and the lands of Kent-Hen-Nefer, i.e. Nubia, will be in joy. The messenger entrusted to carry this letter never got to his destination. The Egyptian army intercepted him. This letter is, however, evidence that the Cushites were literate. Camos did not see the final defeat of the foreign rulers of Egypt. He died before his campaign could be completed. He did, however, conquer as far as the Fayum. New Kingdom Egypt Amos I, his brother, 1709-1683 to B.C., defeated the Hiskos and drove them out of the north, having stormed Memphis and then Avaris. By this conquest, Osmos founded a new dynasty. Although a continuation of the 17th dynasty, historians call it the 18th dynasty, marking the beginning of the New Kingdom period. This was the last great era where Negro Egyptians ruled in independent Egypt. Egypt, and for that matter, Libya, had, however, changed. Both countries now contain large Asian and Afro-Asian populations who have become part of the society over the previous 1,000 years. Many of these Asian populations were white or near white. In addition, the political landscape to the east had changed. Civilizations and states emerged all over Western and Southern Asia. Some of these would challenge Egypt. Moreover, the 12th dynasty was seen as the lost bygone era, where the only remains were now crumbling monuments then over 1,400 years old. The New Kingdom Egyptians would look to this era as a source of inspiration and also a source of building materials to be plundered. Amos led other campaigns. He marched into Canaan and successfully captured the city of Sharuren, where there he gained control over the copper mines. This conquest signified the beginnings of Egyptian empire. After this campaign, he sees Wawat to the south, encountering literal resistance. Egypt now controlled the gold mines and the quarries of the region. Further south, however, the Kushites put up a stronger resistance. Only after several campaigns of a successor king did the Egyptians finally triumph there. Amos created the new post of viceroy to administrate the south, king's son of Kush and overseer of the southern foreign countries, titles that would be in use for hundreds of years. The viceroy ruled from the city of Aniba, guarding Egyptian power. He built a huge fortified complex in Buhen. Besides, he restored the older 12th dynasty castles. In Egypt, he introduced a new administration system. Offices were inherited, and he took steps to limit the power of the nomarchs. Waset, the city of Amun, once more became the religious capital of the empire. Finally, in Abydos, he built a mortuary complex. Amenhotep I ascended the throne in 1682 BC. He gathered about him a creative elite of scientists, artists, architects, poets, and theologians. This elite created the greatest intellectual and cultural flowering since the glorious 12th dynasty. The Ebers Papyrus, the famous medical text, was written during this time as was the Book of the Hidden Chamber, a religious text. The latter book is noteworthy because it depicts the concept of hell. Another achievement concerns the astronomer, Amun Nemhet. He constructed a water clock. Finally, Amenhotep I commissioned constructions at Karnak. The rulers from this time would attempt to outdo each other in religious piety, demonstrated by how much they could contribute to the building program in the city of Waset. Pharaoh Thutmose I, his successor, became the decisive conqueror of Kush in 1661 BC. He burnt the capital since of Kerma have, after having it sacked. In Asia, he marched as far as the river Euphrates, taking Palestine and Syria with little resistance. The Egyptian Empire had Memphis as its military headquarters. Meanwhile, Karnak remained the seat of the intellectuals and theologians. Ainin, the mayor of Waset, oversaw the construction of the Temple of Amun. He also supervised the building of tombs in the Valley of the Kings. 
but Moses Young's song, Um and Mess, was given a military upbringing in Memphis and was later appointed Generalissimo of the Army. Hatshepsut was the next great ruler of dynasty. In September 1650 BC, Futmos I, her father, elevated her to the position of co-regent. Following this, in 1628 BC, she became the great royal wife of Futmos II. In 1615 BC, she ruled as queen regent for Thutmose III, but later disposed him. She proclaimed herself pharaoh in his place and took the religious titles the female Horus and the daughter of Ra. She was deeply religious and did much to undermine the veneration of Set, the deity promoted by the Hiskos and identified as their deity Baal. Her leading statesmen, both of humble origins, Senenmut and Hapusnem, oversaw her building activities. She also appointed Asians to powerful positions within the administration, the first pharaoh to do so. At Karnak, she erected two giant obelisks that rose to almost 100 feet. To make the obelisks still more conspicuous, says J.A. Rogers, she had their tops encased in electrum, a metal costlier than gold. Electrum was a composition of silver and gold. Silver being rather rarer in Egypt is, was more precious. In the bright sunlight of the rainless land, an obelisk shone like glittering peaks. Their brilliancy in the queen's own words lit up the two lands of Egypt. In Del Erbari, she built her celebrated rock-hewn temple dedicated to Amun, Anubis, and Hathor. See page 81. In this temple are records of her famous maritime voyage to Punt, i.e. possibly Somalia or Ethiopia. In that land, the Egyptians bought incense, animals, animal skins, gum, gold, ivory, and ebony. To pay for it, they brought weapons, jewelry, and wares. On the cultural front, great lyric poetry was composed during her period. Early in the reign of Thutmose III, the next ruler, there were threats from Asia. Asian rulers were unifying against Egyptian interests and siding with the Mitanni. In 1599 BC, Thutmose III attacked the Asian coalition in the first of the 17 campaigns to retake the lands of the Euphrates, i.e. Syria. He set up a strict system of administration for the Asian territories headed by General Jahudi. Asian princes who submitted to Egyptian rule kept some control over their territories. Their sons were raised at Egyptian court. His campaigns increased Egyptian power further south as far as the fourth cataract in Kush. On the site of the old Kushite settlement, Thutmose III built a new regional capital. This city, known as Napata, had a famous hill nearby today called Gebel Barkel. Believed to be the dwelling place of the great god Amun-Ra, this hill maintained a sacred importance. Thutmose III and his successor, Amenhotep III, established Egyptians' control over the Nubian sources of gold. Over a hundred mines and gold-working sites have been discovered situated in the eastern deserts of the Sudan, 150 miles from the Nile. The god Ra was often portrayed in gold, showing his divine qualities. Kings who wanted to partake of those divine qualities were buried in golden coffins, as was the case with Pharaoh Tutankhamun. Thutmose III received huge quantities of gold from the Kushite mines. He imported the annual equivalent of 794 kilograms of gold, which would be worth many millions today. From Kush, the pharaohs also received huge quantities of ebony, ivory, slaves, and cattle. As with the Asian princes, the Egyptians had a policy of assimilation for the defeated princes of Kush. Their children were taken to the Egyptian court to be indoctrinated with Egyptian culture. At a later date, these Kushites became part of the administrative class of the Egyptian-dominated government. Finally, Thutmose III built temples throughout the empire from Gebel Barkal in the south to Byblos in the north. He also restored the very ancient Upper Egyptian temples of Esna, Dendera, and Kam Ombo. Professor Honung tells us that Amenhotep II, a successor, placed great emphasis on his martial abilities. In his inscriptions, his warlike mentality is much in evident. The brutality that accompanied his, this attitude, though, seems to have been a personal trait of this king. He conducted his wars with cruelty that was foreign to his father, and he had the bodies of the slain princes hung from the bow of the royal ship. The adoption of warlike Asiatic deities was well suited to this new atmosphere. The period of Amenhotep III, his successor, was long and distinguished. Ascending the throne in 1538 BC, he ruled until 1501 BC. During his early years on the throne, the dominant influences came from his mother, Mutemwia. 
Later, he elevated Tai to the position of great royal wife. She became the real center of power in later years as illness made Amenhotep III more and more dependent on her. Tai built alliances by arranging diplomatic marriages. She also bought off Asian peoples through their gift giving of gold. In return, the Asians sold lapis lazuli and cedar wood. A period of much prosperity and stability. This allowed for the construction of monuments. Amenhotep III commissioned a brilliant new temple in the city of Luxor, containing hundreds of statues of Amun Ra and himself. The Colossi of Memnon stood in front of his great temple of Waset. There were 65 feet high and an awesome 720 tons each. During this prosperity, members of the administrative and ruling class shared the wealth of the land. They had great statues built of themselves and many could afford luxurious tombs. Overlooking the Nile from the West Bank, these private tombs were carved into the hills. A high official under Amenhotep II owned one of these tombs. It had three chapels decorated with color paintings showing daily life activities. In Nubia, Amenhotep III built temples of Solab and Sindinga. This period was indeed a golden age. Goods entered Egypt from Asia, Minor, Crete, Cyprus, and elsewhere in Africa paid by the Egyptian grain, papyrus, linen, and leather. From Asia Minor came coniferous wood. From Syria came oils, resins, weapons of metal, and wine. From Crete came vases. From Cyprus came copper. From the Asian came silver. From Nubia and the lands to the south came ebony, elephant, ivory, gums, leopard and panther skins, ostrich plumes and eggs, resins, and a variety of animals. Caravan trails of donkeys, mules, and asses carried goods to and from Egypt, the western desert, and the Isthmus of Suez. Goods changed hands with the payment of silver, gold, grain, or copper. One unit of Deben, 9.1 grams of gold, equaled two units of silver, equaled 200 units of copper, or 200 bushels of grain. The city of Waset had a population of one million people. It spread out six square miles on both sides of the Nile. On the edge of the metropolis lay the houses of the nobles, typically of 50 or 60 rooms. They had lakes and flower gardens, all accessed by cool, tree-shaded avenues. Inside, they were beautifully painted walls, exquisitely inlaid furniture, gorgeous vases, and fine sculptures. These craft pieces were in gold, bronze, ebony, ivory, and glass. Towards the center of the city stood the royal palace, the House of the Rejoicing, which occupied an astounding 32 hectares. Along the Nile, in the epicenter of the city, stood the great temples of Karnak and Luxor, which towered over everything. Their massive pylons, obelisks, and gates of gold and bronze made a huge statement. In their time, the temples were animated by activities of students and priests. Horse-drawn chariots, sometimes twenty abreast, traversed the Sphinx-lined avenues. On the river lay quays where the merchant ships of the Nile mingled with those of the Mediterranean. Across the river to the western plain stood other temples, equally magnificent, and from there led to the Valley of the Kings, the royal graveyard. Professor Breasted, master of the American Egyptologist, discovered the buildings associated with Amenhotep III. He raised a massive pylon before the Temple of Karnak, adorned with unsurpassed richness. Stellas of lapis lazuli were set up on either side and besides great quantities of gold and silver. Nearly 1,200 pounds of malachite were employed in the inlay work. The king also built a temple to Mut, the goddess of Thebes, i.e. Waset, where his ancestors had begun it, on the south of Karnak, and excavated a lake beside it. He then laid out a beautiful garden in the interval of over a mile and a half, and separates Karnak from the Luxor temple and connected the great avenues of rams. Carved in stone, each bearing a statue of the pharaoh between their forepaws, the general effect must have been imposing in the extreme. The brilliant hues of the polychrome architecture, with columns and gates overwrought in gold and floors overlaid with silver, the whole dominated by towering obelisks clothed in glittering metal rising high above the rich green of the nodding palms and tropical foliage which frame the mass. All of this must have produced an impression both of gorgeous detail and overwhelming grandeur of which the sombre ruins of the same buildings, impressive as they are, offer little hint at the present day. Nor can the scale of the temple complexes be overlooked to cite Reverend Baki once more. Comparisons may help us a little. St. Peter's Rome, Milan, and Notre Dame, Paris, are three of the most familiar and imposing of European cathedrals. 
the whole three put together just equal in area the actual temple building of Karnak. Into the sacred enclosure, you could pack St. Peter's, Milan, Seville, Florence, St. Paul's, Colin, York, Amens, and Antwerp, while Notre Dame would go comfortably into one of the halls of Karnak, and that not the largest, though the most complex and imposing. We are dealing with by far the largest complex of religious building in the world, though the famous labyrinth of the 12th dynasty pharaoh Amenemhat the third, now almost totally destroyed, was still larger in its day. Amenhotep IV, 1501-1474 BC, is best known as a religious reformer. Of this great man, J.A. Rogers says the following, Lord supreme of then civilized world, with the mightiest army at his command, he preached a gospel of peace and preached it so consistently that when subject nations rebelled, he refused to attack them. Living centuries before King David, he, Amenhotep IV, wrote psalms as beautiful as the Judean monarch. 1300 years before Christ, i.e. using the short chronology, he preached and lived a gospel of perfect love, brotherhood, and truth. 2000 years before Muhammad, he taught the doctrine of the one God. 3000 years before Darwin, he sensed the unity that runs through all living things. Akhenaten, too, was the richest man on earth. Having dispatched the high priest of Amun to oversee a quarrying expedition, he promoted the minor deity Aten to the position of sole deity throughout the country. In Karnak, he built a temple to this deity, enforcing a more strict monotheism. The king surrounded himself with a new set of officials. Many of these were foreigners of Egyptians of lower orders. In this way, the Amun priesthood civil service were sidestepped. Unhappy with Waset, the king built a new capital further north called Akhenhatetan. The American urban planner Earl Farouk, in an interesting essay, noted that great importance was attached to the cleanliness of Amarna, i.e. Akhenhatetan, as in other Egyptian cities. Toilets and sewers were in use to dispose waste. Soap was made for washing the body. Perfumes and essences were popular against body odor. A solution of natron was used to keep insects from houses. Armana was landscaped with flowers and beautiful gardens as part of Akhenaten's land use scheme. Amarna may have been the first planned garden city. The temples and personal chapels built throughout the city were open to the air. This allowed for the worship of the sun, which was contrasted with the closed temples of Thebes, i.e. Waset. Officials laid out great estates, attractively incorporating nature into their plans. Worksmen's houses were erected on well-ordered streets in gridiron fashion. By 1493 or 1492 BC, the king's religious revolution was complete. He changed his name from Amenhotep IV to Akhenaten and instituted a revolution in Egyptian art. Gone were the old stylized representations. In some of the new statues, Akhenaten is portrayed as father and mother to the nation with an appropriate synthesis of male and female body shapes. However, all was not going well with the empire. Egypt was losing its grip on its Asian colonies. During this difficult period, Tutankhaten inherited the throne as a boy. Aya, his chief priest, exercised authority almost as regent. Aya led a nonviolent restoration of Amunism. In 1478 BC, Waset, the city of Amun veneration, regained its former status as capital. The young pharaoh changed his name to show this change in religious devotion. Tutankhaten became Tutankhamun. The life and treasures of this young man was, has attracted the imagination of many writers. Madame Christine de Roche Noblecourt wrote a splendid text on him where she describes, among other things, his childhood education. We could not fail to cite the following intelligence. Children's education began very early in Egypt at that time. They began learning to read at an age of four. In the mornings, they were taught to recognize and pronounce the several hundred hieroglyphs representing everything alive and real. When they could read the basic signs, had learned to conjugate verbs and to set pronouns in their proper places, when they could make agreements in number and gender, use figures and do mental arithmetic, they were then taught the heretic script used on papyruses and ostracea. After this, they were introduced to the literary language, its specialized vocabulary, and the system used for transcribing foreign, mainly Asian, nouns. For his exercises, the little prince was privileged to use papyrus, manufactured in Egypt from the time of the first dynasty of fibers, from the great marsh reeds, 
which ordinary school children could not afford. This royal material was most expensive and generally used for making scroll books. School children wrote on calcareous silvers or potsherds, known today as ostraca. The teacher corrected the young prince as strictly as his schoolmates, and when their copies of phrases from popular fables or books of social instruction were faulty, marked them in red ink. On the political front, however, neither Tut nor his in immediate successors effectively challenged the breakup of the Asian Empire. Ramses I ascended the throne in 1456 BC. During his year on the throne, he built additions in the Karnak complex. Pharaoh Sidi I, founder of the 19th dynasty, ruled from 1450 to 1395 BC. Unlike previous rulers, his court was principally based at Memphis. From here, he led campaigns into Asia, Nubia, and against the Libyans. His greatest architectural achievement has impressed architects for many years. He built the 134-columned Hippostyle Hall at Karnak. James Ferguson, a widely respected architectural scholar, described the hall as the most magnificent on which the eye of man has ever rested. Seti, as his name suggests, was also a devotee of Set, the ancient god of the south. The burial chamber of Seti I was decorated with heavenly constellations. Together with the planisphere in the temple of Denendra, we believe that this shows the Egyptian understanding of the zodiac. The period of Seti I was a great period of continued eternal wealth and political stability. Ramses II became king in 1394 BC and ruled for 66 years. In the swamplands of the Delta, he built the city of Pi Ramses, the new capital. It boasted sphinxes, obelisks, and statues. In Waset, he commissioned major buildings in Karnak and Luxor. In Kush, he built the two rock-cut temples of Abu Simbel. According to Professor Hornung, Ramses II's buildings' activities were such that in Egypt and Nubia alike, there is scarcely any excavation site where monuments of this king has not come to light. There was, however, a negative side. We have to acknowledge the tireless architects of Ramses II for the fact that nothing is left of the absolutely enormous buildings of the Egypt's Middle Kingdom. They plundered the temples of the Fayum, particularly the pyramid temples at El Lahun and Hawara, just as they plundered those in Memphis of the White Walls and Heliopolis. The remarkable labyrinth at Amenhemet III's at Hawara, perhaps the largest single building in antiquity, according to eyewitness accounts, suffered severely during Ramses's reign. However, problems emerged with the Hittites, the great military empire in the Turkish region. This state threatened Egypt's Asian interests, and great battle between the two powers took place in 1389 BC in Syria near a town called Kadesh. Though the outcome is disputed, it seems clear that the Egyptians lost control of their northern territories in the Near East. A century later, the Egyptian Empire in the East had all but collapsed. Meanwhile, the supply of gold from the south was in decline. mer the next ruler, was the 13th son of Ramses II. Dissatisfied with the Pi Ramses, he re-established Memphis as the new royal residence. Under his direction, Memphis, that most ancient city, gained a new prestige. Building a palace complex near the Temple of Ta, mer was venerated for this piety in later times. On the practical front, new challenges emerged. A sinister alliance between the various European peoples and the Libyans had been forged. They attempted an invasion of Egypt. mer forces crushed this invasion party in 1323 BC. Seti II succeeded mer in 1308 BC and had a long reign. During his career, Maswi, the Nubian viceroy, rebelled against him and became the ruler of Upper Egypt. Seti II defeated him in battle. Queen regent Tower Set became the next ruler and brought some stability since Sipta, the direct descendant of Seti II, was merely a child. The boy's early death, however, elevated Tower Set to the status of pharaoh. She, in turn, elevated Bey, her favorite, to, the be, to be the real power holder in the country. Bey was a man of Syrian origins. Like Pharaoh Hatshepsut before her, Tara Set was buried in the Valley of the Kings after her death. Setnecht founded the 20th dynasty in 1236 BC. After six years on the throne, Ramses III succeeded him. Ramses III modeled himself on Ramses Kadesh from Ramses II's temple into his own structure. In any case, his mortuary temple at Medinet Habu was an architectural triumph. 
Evidence exists to show that roughly contemporaneous with the time of Ramses III, if not much earlier, the Egyptians, or else some of a other group of Negroes, engaged in maritime activities across the Atlantic. Documents from the time of Ramses III mention voyages to the ends of the earth, and also voyages to the mountain of far west of the world. Mr. Rafiq Jazaraz Hoy, an Indian scholar of considerable erudition, identified this region as ancient Mexico and the African voyagers as Egyptians. He pointed out a huge number of cultural continuities between the Nile Valley and those in Almec, Mexico. There are colossal stone carvings of human heads produced by the Almecs, the formative Native American civilization. Sixteen such heads have been found. Two were recovered from Tre Zapotes, four from La Venta, six from San Lorenzo, and four from other sites, all weighed between 10 and 40 tons. All of them have African facial features, and one has braided hairstyle. The earliest has been dated at about 1160 BC and some to 580 BC. Jose M. Melgar, a Mexican, found one of the carvings in 1862. In 1869, he wrote a bulletin on it for the Mexican Society of Geography and Statistics. What astonished me, says Melgar, was the Ethiopic type represented. I reflected that there had undoubtedly been Negroes in this country and that this had been in the first epic of the world. In 1963, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Texas, held an exhibition of Almec artifacts between 18 June and 25th August. Alfonso Medellin Zeniel wrote the introductory essay for the exhibition catalog, The Almec Tradition. In this essay, we are assured that the colossal heads and Monument F of Tres Zapotes principally have vigorous and precise Negro physical characteristics, such as prominent cheekbones, thick lips, and platyrene noses. For a long time, there was a concern as to what their hair is or was, since, in this case of colossal heads, they are invariably covered by a cap or helmet. This doubt has gone on indefinitely, but finally some light has been thrown on the problem with the discovery of two heads. Point seventy-five meters tall, which are identified as numbers 1 and 2 of Laguna de los Cerros, on which, together with the characteristic cheekbones and platyrin noses, there is hair arrangement of head of curly hair. Supplementing this iconographic evidence are a vast number of artifacts that depict Africans in Native American art. In 1966, Count Alexander von Wutenau, a German art historian, held an exhibition of, for President Senghor of Senegal in Dakar the Senegalese capital. A number of ancient African faces clearly emerged. Von Wutenau published twice on this issue. In 1969, his Art of the World, pre-Columbian terracottas, emerged in English. In 1976, he followed this with the unexpected faces of ancient Mexico. A number of his Im images appear in books by Professor Ivan von Sertema. Count von Wutenau's books are profound and wide-reaching, and their implications for ancient American history are thus difficult to summarize. Below, we have reproduced a good statement from his 1969 text of what he sought to convey. The Negroid element is well proven by large Almac stone monuments as well as the terracotta items and therefore cannot be excluded from pre-Columbian history of the Americas. Furthermore, it is precisely the Negroid representations which often indicate personalities of high position, who can unhesitatingly be compared to the outstanding Negroes who served as models for great works of art in Egypt and Nigeria. According to Van Sertema, the cultural impact of Africans on the Olmecs was considerable. The Native Americans built pyramids with the north-south orientation. The Nile Valley pyramids have a north-south orientation. At Cerro de la Pedre, there is an image of Native American dignitary wearing a double crown. This can be compared to the pharaonic double crown. At Axta Titlin, there is a painting of a man holding a flail in an African manner. This can be compared to the royal flail of the pharaohs. In San Lorenzo, there is a head of a man painted purple. In the Nile Valley, there, this was the color for the priests and the royalty. Finally, there are several images from ancient American art of distinguished people sporting false beards. In ancient Egypt, the false beard of the pharaoh was regarded as a sign of wisdom. Even Hatshepsut, the female ruler, was depicted in the art wearing a false beard. Professor Andrzej Wersinski, a Polish authority on craniometry, 
drew attention to the skeletal remains of the African presence. He presented a paper at the 41st International Congress of the Americanists in 1974 based on research he completed in 1972. 13.5% of the skulls at the earlier Almac sites of Titilico were Africans. At Cerro de la Mesas, a later Almac site, 4.5% of the skulls were found to be of Africans. The burials were arranged with African males buried next to Native American females. The evidence suggests that the Africans and the Native Americans progressively intermarried. However, it is important to note that Wyrskinski's mythology is far from perfect and thus his findings are very far from the conclusive. We feel that more research in this area is required to clean up the physical anthropology of the Almac period cemeteries. Returning to Egypt, however, political problems emerged with the Sea Peoples. Of European origins, they invaded Egypt from the sea. Other problems emerged with the Libyans. Ramesses III repelled both groups of invaders. On the domestic front, in addition, there were great discontent. Workers went on strike in 1200 BC when their payments in kind were in arrears by over two months. They marched on the Ramesseum. More problems emerged. There were attempts to, at grave robbing. Many of the strikers were implicated in this activity. From a later period, the time of Ramesses the ninth after 1173 bc there is a transcript of a court case involving a grave robber and his gang amun nufer the gang leader confessed after being tortured by the egyptian authorities we went to rob the tombs in accordance with our regular habit says amun nufer and we found the pyramid tomb of king sekhem reshatawi son of ra sobekemsef this being not at all like the pyramids and tombs of the nobles we habitually went to rob we took our metal tools and forced a way into the pyramid of this king through the innermost part. We found its underground chambers and we took lighted candles in our hands and went down. Then we broke through the rubble and found this god lying at the back of his burial place. And we found the burial place of Queen Nubkas, his queen situated beside him. We opened the sarcophagi and their coffins and found the noble mummy of this king. We collected the gold we found on the noble mummy of this god together with that on his amulets and jewels. We collected all that we found upon her likewise and set fire to their coffins. Thus I, together with the other thieves who are with me, have continued down to this day in the practice of robbing the tombs of the nobles and people of the land in the west of Thebes. There were severe penalties for these types of activities, but tomb robbery proved unrelenting. As is well known, only Pharaoh Tutankhamun escaped this plunder from the ancient times. The persistence of tomb robbery was almost a byproduct of corruption among the governing classes, especially during the 20th dynasty. All of the reigns of the kings, Ramses IV to Ramses X, were weak and unstable, characterized by crime waves and famine. After the fall of this dynasty, central authority collapsed. Egypt became split into two powers, the north and the south. The high priest of Amun-Ra at the Temple of Karnak became the ruler of the south. After this period, Penhesi, the viceroy of Kush, declared independence for his territory. The Egyptians lost their supply of gold. Another Penhesi became the ruler of Upper Egypt. General Pinnick succeeded him, followed by Harihor. Ramses the Eleventh, the last king of this dynasty, exercised no power in the south. Semendez of the 21st dynasty ascended in the throne in 1089 BC, ruling from the city of Tanis. Egypt had some semblance of stability under his rule, but in reality, the high priest of Amun continued to dominate Upper Egypt. Amunism flourished in Tanis and it did, as it did in the south, but politics continued to split the land into two countries for generations. Friendly relations between the two territories, however, were the norm. Historians call this epoch the Third Intermediate Period. The Libyans finally achieved power over the north in around 940 BC with the ascension of Shoshank I. He established the 22nd dynasty after the death of Pharaoh Sunsenes II, the last Tanite king. Shoshank I made some effort to bring greater unity to the country. Sometime around 936 BC, he appointed his son to the post of high priest of Amun. Later kings would do the same. Another branch of his household ruled Heracleopolis under Prince Nimrut. Consequently, Libyan power emanating from the same family was felt all over the country. 
924 BC, Sir Shank I launched a raid on Jerusalem. Despite the appellation Libyan to the dynasty, it is not yet known whether or not they were genuine Africans since Libya also had populations descended from the Hyskos and also the Sea Peoples. In the South, however, there was no such confusion. Kush Immediately to the south of Egypt lay the land of Wawat. It was a territory of great wealth due to the presence of gold mines. To the south of Wawat lay the land of Kush. The Egyptians called the people of Kush Nehesi, meaning the people who inhabited the river valley as against the Medje, the people who occupied the wadis of the eastern desert. The term Kush comes from the Egyptian Kaz or Kash slash Kesh. The term was clearly acceptable to the Kushites who also used it. Dr. Wellsby of the British Museum informs us that during the 25th dynasty, 747 to 656 BC, at the time when the Kushites ruled Egypt, at least one inscription refers to the Kush by the old Egyptian term for the area south of the frontier. Tasseti meaning the land of the bow. In our view, this indicates some connection between the Kushite kingdom and the much earlier Pharaonic kingdom that predated Egypt. Dr. Wellsby explained the global importance of the Kushites as follows. Consideration of the Kushites alongside such giants of the ancient world as the Greeks, Romans, and Egyptians is justified on the account of the longevity of the kingdom and its, of its size, if for no other reasons. At the time when Rome was a small village on the banks of the Timber and the Greek city-states held sway over minuscule territories, the Kushites ruled an empire stretching from the central Sudan to the borders of Palestine. Of this new Kushite kingdom, archaeologists know the earliest royal burial as Lord A of the tomb, Kutum I. He was buried with a large number of objects that included pottery and gold and jewelry. The capital of this kingdom was Al-Kuru. This city had monumental buildings and was walled for defensive purposes. Surrounding them are wide tracts of irrigable land. The dating of this period, however, is controversial. Some say that Lord A ruled around the 11th century BC, others say the 9th century BC. Reisner and his supporters, continues Dr. Wellsby, favor a short chronology where the burials at El Kulru, prior to the historical dated King Pai, i.e. Pianke, are assumed to be six rulers, the other graves being those of the members of the royal family. He, Reisner writes, if we take, a, if we take the beginning of Pianke's Pai's reign, at about 740 BC, we get 860 to 920 BC for the date of the oldest ancestor, he of Kutum I. The proponents of the long chronology believe that many more of the graves are of those rulers and therefore that the time span involved must be considerably greater. The second Kushite capital was Napata, also named after its famous hill Gebel Barkal. Originally an Egyptian religious center, it was sacred to Amun and the home of his Ka, i.e. vital force or spirit. The Egyptians built an important temple there during the 18th dynasty. Pharaoh Thutmose III raised a stella that informs us that the, his divine mandate to rule came from both Amun in the Waset and Amun in Gebel Barkal. The Kushites shared this religious belief and thus Napata regained its importance. The Kushite rulers were buried at Nuri, a short distance upstream. King Alara, or perhaps a predecessor, built a temple of Amun in Kawa. He or his successor may have built Temple B-800 in Gebel Barkal. Kasha was the next ruler. His name means the Kushite. Extending Kushite power into the Egypt, he took control of Waset in 760 BC and received the divine mandate of Amun to rule. He installed his daughter as the successor to the post of High Priestess of Amun. After his death, he was buried in a gilded wooden anthropoid coffin from which fragments of gold foil, lapis lazuli, and colored glass are still in existence. Charles Finch and Larry Williams argued that it became the standard practice for the Kushite pharaohs to place their female relatives in this position. These women, working through their own prime ministers, were in effect rulers of Upper Egypt. They undertook massive restoration and public works in Thebes, i.e. Waset, and throughout Upper Egypt. Their names are on scores of monuments, buildings, and statues. The Kushite pharaohs ruled mainly from Napata and seemed to have had the utmost confidence in their female relatives to govern Upper Egypt. At a later date, however, Queen Mothers Shana da Kete and Amaneshak Keto ruled Kush as pharaohs with the full insignia. Reliefs on temple walls depict these rulers with special iconographies that integrate these females into the role of kings. Pharaoh Pai, also known as Pianki, Kasha's successor, 
continued to exercise power over Egyptian affairs. His troops occupied much of Upper Egypt. Estella and Gebel Barkel suggest that the Egyptians petitioned Pai to intervene in Egypt probably to counter the power of Tefnekte, a local dynast in Lower Egypt. Pai is now not portrayed as conqueror of Egypt, but as a protector of his ancient religion. After his victory, he spared Tefnekt and gradually withdrew Kushite power from Egypt. Pai was also an important builder. He refurbished and enlarged the old Egyptian temple of Amun at Gebel Barkel. Considered the single most important religious building in Kush, he extended it towards the Nile. He raised a substantial hippostyle hall entered through the enormous pylon. The building was 500 feet long and about 135 feet wide. Pai may have also been responsible for extending Temple B-800. He built a palace next to this temple. Since neither Costa nor Pai's invasions of Egypt resulted in, in destruction nor looting, Dr. Wellesby feels that this suggests that they were motivated more by piety than by territorial ambitions. Professor Hansberry, the pioneer African-American historian, was also of this opinion. In almost every instance, where we are able to get a glimpse of Ethiopian, i.e. Kushite sovereigns, great warriors, though they were, we find them free of those rapacious and piratic habits that have so often sullied the otherwise brilliant careers of so many monarchs of other nations. In Pai's triumph march through Egypt, we are told that before he would attack a city, he would first offer it the most favorable terms of peace to avoid fighting, for it was his desire that harm should come to no one, that not even a babe might have to cause to cry. When he left Egypt to return to Ethiopia, he did not leave behind a land filled with the slain and the ruins of towns which he had burned, nor were there fields blackened with ashes of the crops which he had set on fire. The spirit of tolerance and forbearance was also evident on the part of Shabaka. The same statesmanlike qualities are expressed in the activities of the Ethiopian king Taharka. Here were true representatives of Homer's blameless and Hesiod's high-souled Ethiopians. Pai was buried at al Kulru on his death in 716 BC. His tomb was the first among the Kushites to be marked by a pyramid. For the next thousand years, pyramids were built in cemeteries in Nuri, Gebel Barkel, and Meroe. In total, there are at least 223 pyramids in Kush, far more than in Egypt. These haughty monuments and steep sides that sloped at between 60 degrees and 73 degrees, giving the buildings a more slender appearance. An exception to this pyramid, number 7, at Nori, which is a bent pyramid recalling the bent pyramid of Dashur, the Kushite pyramids usually had an offering chapel on the eastern side. Originally constructed of clay bricks, the later chapels progressed to the use of sandstone blocks. They were rectangular buildings entered by a central door. Some had the same standard pylonic design typical of many Kushite temples. In their time, these monuments were covered in white plaster, usually painted red or white. They possessed circular plaques inserted as surface decoration and also had a band of stars painted around their bases. Lady Lugger wrote, On the base of the one monuments a zodiac has been found. Professor Diop adds, Lepsius, later discovered in Meroe, the foundation of an astro astronomical observatory, there on the walls of the edifice was found a scene representing persons operating an instrument which it might not be appropriate to call an astrolabe. There are also found a series of numerical equations relating to astro astronomic events which occurred two centuries before. Shabako, also called Shabaka, Pai's brother and successor, reconquered Egypt and is generally credited with founding the 25th dynasty. We, however, believe that the credit for starting the dynasty should go to Alara, a predecessor. Before becoming king, Shabako served in the army and was stationed in the delta for some years. After ascending to the throne, he built a huge empire. Memphis became a royal residence of the Kushite pharaohs, and Waset became the capital of the empire. Inscriptions inform us that Kush was divided into gnomes, as was Egypt, each with its own capital. As ruler, Shabako abol abolished the death penalty and replaced it with hard labor to cite Herodotus. When an Egyptian was guilty of an offense, his plan was not to punish him with death. Instead of so doing, he sentenced him according to the nature of his crime. In the Near East, the Assyrians and near white Semitic power rose to the imperial prominence at this time, ruling from their city of Nineveh. As their armies conquered territories to the west of Mesopotamia, conflict with the Kushite pharaohs of Egypt seemed inevitable. 
Initially, there was diplomatic relations between the Kushites and the Assyrians, but things came to a head. The Assyrians attempted to invade the kingdom of Judah, an ally of Cush. The Assyrian invasion, however, came to naught. Plague destroyed the Assyrian armies. Taharko, also called Taharka, ruled from 690 until 664 BC. He inherited a huge empire from Kebhor in Asia to the lands south of Napata. In addition, Erathosens claimed that he conquered a vast territory in North Africa and penetrated into Europe as far as the Pillars of Hercules, Gibraltar. Corroborating this, Professor Ivan von Sertima wrote that, We also have a clear and indisputable reference to this in a Spanish manuscript by Florian de Ocampo, Cronica General, published in 1553. The name of the invading general is given as Taraco, Taharco. He is not only identified as a head of Ethiopian, i.e. Kushite army, the reference is more specific. It says he was later to become king of Egypt. The name, the period, the historical fact of his generalship, and his later kingship in Egypt all attest to the validity of this reference. Moreover, there is some evidence to be discussed in later chapter that the newly founded North African city of Carthage was part of a sphere of influence. Thus, his imperial activities give substance to his boast of being the emperor of the world. Of this great man, Professor Rawlinson wrote the following. The reign of Tir Haka, Terek, during this period appears to have been glorious. He was regarded by Judea as his protector and exercised a certain influence over all Assyria as far as Taurus, Amanus, and the Euphrates. In Africa, he brought into subjection the native tribes of the north coast, carrying his arms, according to some, as far as the pillars of Hercules. He is exhibited at Meninabu in the dress of a warrior, smiting with a mace ten captive foreign princes. He erected monuments in the Egyptian style at Thebes, Memphis, and Napata. Of all the Ethiopian, i.e. Kushite sovereigns of Egypt, he was undoubtedly the greatest. One authority described him as a great builder approaching the scale of Ramses II. According to Vivian Davies and Rene Friedman, Taharka was a great builder, erecting temples, shrines and statues throughout the Nile Valley, and turning Gebel Barkal into an architectural showpiece. A central temple at southern version of Karnak in Thebes, though on a smaller scale, high up on the great pinnacle he had an inscription recording in his dominance carved in hieroglyphics and sheathed in gold, to be visible far and wide, no doubt a spectacular sight as it glistened in the sun. In Kawa, Taharko restored a temple by clearing the sand from around it. He also built a large temple for Amun. This building was of sandstone blocks. It had an outer colonnade court entered between two pylons. Beyond the court lay a hippostyle hall. This led into a sanctuary that was flanked by a number of ancillary rooms. In Gebel Barkal, he expanded the Temple of Amun, B500, into a formidable monument, 150 meters long. There are similar temples at Sanam and Tabo that were probably commissioned by him. These buildings share affinities with those of Egypt from the Old Kingdom period. At Kassiriabrum, he built the earliest Kushite temple there. Additionally, in Nuri, he built the largest pyramid in Kush, N1. It was 51.75 meters square at the base and rose to a soaring height of 49 meters. In Egypt, he built the six-columned kiosk situated in the forecourt of the Temple of Amun of Karnak. Dr. Brooks Bertram, an African-American scholar, notes that the Toraco did much to reclaim the artistic and religious ideas that had lain dormant since the time of Egypt's Old Kingdom. Taharka saw sculptures who probably belonged to the workshops which produced the reliefs in the Theban tombs of officials of the reign of Taharka and the beginning of the side dynasties. It is in this temple of Kawa that we find raised reliefs decorating the Hippostyle Hall and sunken reliefs copied after or reviving Old Kingdom reliefs. The use of Old Kingdom royal models at Kawa is the most striking and one of the earliest examples of this type of relief. In the Temple of Kawa, Taharka was also responsible for the revival of pyramid texts in literature and the old text of the Memphite theology. Not only were the Kawa temples a treasure trove of Nubian royal inscriptions, second only to Jebel Barkal, Kawa was local center of considerable importance. At Kassiriabrum, and a temple with some extent frescoes from this epoch was also constructed. Taharko resided at Tanis in northern Egypt, probably to keep watch on its northeastern frontier. In 671 BC, the Assyrians evaded Kushite-controlled territory and captured as far as the Memphis. 
Taharko reoccupied the city in 669 BC and reestablished Kushite rule in Lower Egypt. The Assyrians marched once more and established Egyptian vassals as far as south as Waset without taking control of the city. Tenwatamani was the next ruler of Kush. He reestablished Kushite control over the city of Memphis. The Assyrian response was to evade the south once more. They reached Waset and, de and devastated it in 663 BC. They placed Sematic I, a vassal, on the throne. Sematic, in turn, installed his daughter as the successor high priestess of Amun in 654 BC, replacing the Kushite priestess who held that position. The destruction of the glorious city of Waset was a turning point. It ended the dominance of blacks in the world history. Even in ruins, however, the city tells a timely story. For if the blacks had never left a single written record of their past greatness, observes Chancellor Williams, the late African-American historian, the record would still stand, defying time, in the deathless stones of Thebes, Waset, of her fallen columns from temples, monuments, and her pyramids, a city more eternal than Rome because its foundation was laid before the dawn of history, and its plan was that copied by other cities of the world. If the blacks of today wish to measure the distance to the heights from which they have fallen, they need go no further than Noe, Waset. Egypt had fallen under the foreign rule of Assyrians. From then until now, the land was repeatedly occupied and looted by different Middle Eastern and European peoples. The occupations changed the character of Egyptian culture. From being purely African before the Second Intermediate Period, it became African and Asian afterwards. Eventually, it became the Arab-dominated Afro-Eurasian mix that characterizes North Africa in the present era. For this reason, the Copts of modern Egypt no longer resemble the ancient Egyptian skulls, mummies, or sculptures. There are, of course, Coptic populations in Sudan and Ethiopia, and also Nubian populations in Egypt and Sudan, who do resemble the ancient Egyptians in these respects. Lieutenant Francis Wilford, a pioneer and English Orientalist, made the following observation many years ago. The modern Copts of Egypt are far from answering to the description given by Herodotus, and their features differ from those of the mummies and of the ancient statues brought from Egypt, whence it appears, that their ancestors had large eyes with long slit, projecting lips and folded ears of remarkable size. Dr. R. R. Madden, after studying thousands of mummy heads and many other ancient skulls from different civilizations, made a similar observation a few years later. Herodotus, whose own observations are deemed voracious, describes the old Egyptians, among whom he was residing as people of black skins and short woolly hair. The Copts of Egypt have neither one nor the other, and above all, what, in my opinion, is the strongest of all evidence on the subject is the utter dissimilarity in the form of the heads of both people. It is among the modern Nubians who are to search for the descendants of the Egyptians." A swarthy race, with wiry hair, surpassing in the beauty of their slender forms, all the people of the East, now living on the southern confines of Egypt, where probably their ancestors had been driven by the Persians. Kushite power was restricted to the first cataract, the old Egyptian Nubian border. It was in Kush that Pharaonic culture was preserved. Kush's southerly location saved it from the invasions that undermined and whitened Egypt. Professor Williams continues, the Africans, eventually barred from further rule in Egypt, continued Pianchi's, i.e. Pai's, line first from the capital of Napata and then at Meroe, where they promoted a broad reconstruction program. Having lost both Upper and Lower Egypt, Ethiopia's, i.e. Kush's, border had been pushed to the first cataract at Aswan. Other invasions came. The Persians took over and their domination of Egypt lasted from 525 to 404 B.C., they returned in 343 BC. Alexander of the Greeks reached Egypt in 332 BC. Upon his death, one of his most outstanding generals became Pharaoh as Ptolemy I, thus beginning 300 years of Macedonian Greek rule. Towards the end of the Greek domination, the expansion of the Roman Empire had transferred the real center of power to Rome, Assyria, Persia, Greece, Rome. The continuing process of transforming a black civilization into a near-white civilization. Ethiopia, i.e. Kush, now began at the first cataract in the north and extended south into the present-day Ethiopia. It was now bounded by Upper Egypt, the Red Sea, and the Libyan Desert. Egypt under Semitic II invaded Kush in 593 BC, marching as far as the third cataract. 
Some authorities believe that this invasion destroyed the city of Napata. He also had the names and special insignia of 25th dynasty rulers removed from Egyptian monuments. Napata was the original religious capital of Kush, but this religious role gradually transferred to the more southerly city of Meroe following this invasion. Pharaoh's Pelta, 593 to 568 BC, commissioned the famous Temple of the Sun and the Temple of Amun, both raised in the city of Meroe. The Sun Temple was built on a podium approached by an inclined ramp. It had a colonnade running around the edge. The earliest occupation of Meroe dates back to the 10th century BC. A solid wall made of dressed stone blocks encircled its royal city. Over three meters thick, the walls had towers that projected at angles and the enceinte. Similar towers probably flanked some of the gates. In addition, the city contained a famous building that shared affinities with the Roman bath. Its central feature was a large pool approached by a flight of steps. The water spouts were decorated with lion's heads, and the edge of the basin had inlaid faience, roundels, and panels. In its heyday, Meroe supported 200,000 soldiers and 4,000 artisans. In 525 BC, the Persians under King Cambyses conquered Egypt. A year later, the Persians attempted to invade Cush. Herodotus described the expedition as an embarrassment. It failed miserably in the desert. Before this attempted invasion, however, Derek Wellsby tells us that Cambyses had sent a mission to the Cushite court, the members of which were blatantly spying. The source of this intelligence is Herodotus, the histories. In this work, Herodotus informs us that the Cushite king showed the Persian paid agents a number of things during their stay in the country. He led them to a fountain where and when they had washed, they found their flesh all glossy and sleek as if they had bathed in oil, and a scent came from the spring like that of violets. When they quitted the fountain, the king led them to a prison, where the prisoners were all of them bound with fetters of gold. Among these Ethiopians, i.e. Cushites, coppers of all metals, the most scarce and valuable. After they had seen the prison, they were likewise shown what is called the table of the sun. Also, last of all, they were allowed to behold the coffins of the Ethiopians, which are made, according to report, of crystal. Professor William Leo Hansberry, formerly of Howard University, demonstrated that many of the more startling details of Herodotus' account stand up to critical scrutiny and can be corroborated with other evidence. Concerning the violet-scented fountain, for example, Dr. Hansberry wrote that, the excavations at Meroe by Liverpool Expedition revealed not only the remains of elaborately constructed baths and beautifully decorated swimming pools, but in one of the pools there has been found a column of plaster within whose center has been embedded an earthenware pipe apparently designed to convey water through the column. The pipe is threaded through the column, says W.S. George, the engineer of Expedition, and is similar in character to the other pipes which were used in connection with the heat with the heating and conveying of water through the pipes. However, it is smaller than the pipes used for such purposes, and such pipes are not embedded in the columns of plaster. This pipe is threaded column, therefore it must have, been, must have had some other use. George hinted that it might once have stood upright in the pool, and by some system of hydraulics, water may have been forced up through the column to its top, thus producing a fountain-like cascade in the center of the pool. With such a pool in mind, and by assuming that the waters used in the baths were treated with some aromatic spices or salts from for which Ethiopia, i.e. Kush, had long been noted, it becomes easy enough to believe Herodotus' account. On the question of golden fetters used to enchain prisoners, Hansbury wrote, Gold was beyond any question a most plentiful commodity. In the Asian kingdoms contemporary with the 18th dynasty, there was a belief that gold was in Egypt as common as dust. Yet the truth of the matter is that practically no such precious metal was native to Egypt. It was for the most part of Ethiopian, i.e. Cushitic, origin, and there are many Egyptian documents which shed considerable light on the ways and means by which the metal reached the northern kingdom out of the south. In the tomb of Hui, a viceroy in Ethiopia in the reign of King Tutankhamun, 1350 BC, there is a painting showing the products sent to Egypt by this official. Along with hundreds of other precious things, there are an enormous quantity of gold represented in the variety of forms. In rings and bags and sacks of gold dust, an Egyptian official on duty in Ethiopia instructs this officer to procure for the royal treasury, among other things, much good gold, including fans of gold, gold wrought in dishes, and refined gold in bushels. Finally, concerning the coffins of crystal, Hansberry tells us that, Archaeological research in Ethiopia has yet revealed no evidence of the existence of such practice. However, some seeming confirmation does exist. 
Tessius of Sindus, a Greek physician living at the court of the Persian king Artaxerxes Memnon in 415 to 398 BC, and the author of an ancient, anciently famous but long lost history of Persia and India, has preserved through the pages of Diodorus an interesting notice supplementary to Herodotus's account of burial practices in Ethiopia. The wealthier Ethiopian, Ethiopians, so the story goes, after embalming the body of the dead, placed it in a hollow statue of gold made to resemble the deceased. The statue was covered with melted glass and set up in, the, in some conspicuous place where it could be viewed for a time by the living relatives. The Ethiopians of lesser fortune followed the same general practice except that the hollow statue, instead of being made of gold, was composed of silver or of potter's clay. The basis of this wealth was a dynamic economy. Animal husbandry and agriculture formed the backbone. The Kushites grew crops of vines, cotton, sorghum, date palms, wheat, barley, beans, lentils, and vegetables. Moreover, they reared sheep, goats, and cattle. There were civil engineering activities to harness water for irrigation and animal husbandry. Kushite genius is attested to by their construction of a national system of reservoirs. Strategically located at Musawara, Naka, Horden, Um, Yuseda, and Ngizara region at Dwinib, Basa, etc. They were built to survive the ever-encroaching desert. Oxen-powered wheels operated the irrigation. Gold and iron working were important economic mainstays. In 1834 AD, the famous Italian grave robber and vandal, Giuseppe Ferlini, unearthed some important examples of Kushite gold work from the Pyramid of Kentucky. Ominous Shaketo, see page 206. Among other things, a golden armlet and ring were recovered made of gold and inlaid glass. They were superlative pieces of work that incorporated a complex mix of Nile Valley religious symbols with perhaps some Greek design influences. Apart from these treasures, many other golden pieces were recovered from Kush, including ornate amulets, wajed eyes, knives, decorated cylinder sheaths, tweezers, gold flower necklaces, and earrings. Gold would Gold was also used to decorate temples. One writer reported that recent excavations at Meroe and Maserat as Sufra revealed temples with walls and statues covered with gold leaf. Intriguing examples of steel tools have been discovered from the time of the 25th dynasty, according to Dr. Finch. Five specimens were analyzed by Williams and Maxwell Hislop. The tools were notable for their remarkably good condition and for their surprisingly modern appearance. Two of the five tools analyzed were composed of low-carbon steels, 0.1 to 0.2% carbon content. But even this low-carbon level was sufficient to convey a hardness three times greater than iron. Moroi became the center of an iron-working industry that produced metal of superior quality. Based on the huge scale of the iron-working activities, one early archaeologist described the city as the Birmingham of Africa. A more recent archaeologist, A.J. Arkel, visited the site and witnessed for himself the remains of iron slag left by the old manufacturing processes. On the comparison with Birmingham, he concluded that, I think this is a fair description. In addition to iron, they produced bronze works. There were trade routes connecting Moroi to ports on the Red Sea, such as Adhab. There was trade to the north with Egypt and also southwards to the hill regions of Ethiopia. It was also likely that Kush traded westward towards the Niger River. The Kushites imported Egyptian pottery, wine, honey, and olive oil. In later years, they imported Greek and Roman luxury products and also goods from the east. To pay for these products, they exported gold, ivory, and iron. Barges, donkeys, and more rarely camels were employed to move these goods to the markets. There were royal palaces at Wab ben Naka, Maserat, Meroe, Gebel Barkel, Napata, Sanum, Kawa, and Nubs. Furthermore, there were fortified settlements at Sheikh Dod, Faraz, Sapakura, Kalabash, and Ikemindi. These forts have an identical gateway design. Amanish Keto's palace at Wad bin Naka had been excavated. It was 61 meters square and had columned halls, corridors, and long narrow rooms. It had at least two stories with the palatial apartments on the upper floor. In northern Nubia, very small houses have been excavated. In Gamanari, House, housing complexes have been found that consisted of two-room apartments. 
At Abu Ghali, the entire village was discovered to be an interconnected complex consisting of dwellings of two or more stories, where each of the dwellings must have been apartments. Houses near Abu Simbel were vaulted structures with alcoves and niches. They had staircases, some internal and others external. At Karanag, a castle has been excavated. Of three stories high, its rooms were arranged around a central internal courtyard. Scholars do not think royalty resided there, but more ordinary people. Archaeology has also turned up an interesting surprise. A tavern was discovered at Kassiria Broom. It was a rectangular building consisting of six interconnecting rooms. Also found it were the fragments of goblets and amphorae, numbering thousands. Pharaoh Harsiotef of the 4th century BC rebuilt a temple in the southern city of Tara. He decorated the Amun Temple of Napata with gold. He covered the statues of Amun with gold rings and commissioned golden figures of saints, ram's heads, and beads. He added a new sanctuary to this monument of acacia wood, overlaid with gold. This extension boasted vessels of bronze and silver, including the censers, lampstands, and shovels. The temple was well provided with honey, incense, and myrrh. Harris Yotef also led campaigns. His bowmen made nine raids against regional enemies, probably with the aim of seizing all the caravan routes from Axum into Egypt. He ruled for at least 35 years. The period that began with Pharaoh Natsen, 3228 to 308 BC, was highly remarkable. It was distinguished by originality in architecture and also pottery. Besides this, the Kushites had developed another script. The Meroic script had 23 letters, of which four were vowels, and there were also a word divider. They developed a numerical system for mathematics. Writing was generally done on purposely designed wood and skins, but examples are also found on walls, vases, etc. Hundreds of old texts survived in this script. Diodorus Siculus, a Greek contemporary, says that unlike in Egypt, universal literacy was achieved in Kush. During this period, the capital was moved from Napata to Moroi, although the pharaohs continued to be crowned on the golden throne of Napata. According to Dr. Basil Davidson, one of the notable achievements of the Kushites was the taming of the African elephant. African elephants are not nearly as pliable as their Indian cousins. His evidence for this was the enormous temple complex of Moserat, dated 220 B.C., Dr. Derek Wellsby offers evidence that supports this position. The area to the south of the Egyptian frontier was the important source of elephants for the armies of the Ptolemies, allowing them to match the Indian elephants of the Seleucids. It is likely that many of these animals came from the realm of the Kushites. Arian records that before elephants were employed in warfare by the Macedonians and Carthaginians, they used by the Ethiopians, i.e. Kushites, and the Indians. There were also other references to the use of made by the Ethiopians of war elephants and their prowess as mahuts, but whether we are justified in equating these Ethiopians with the Kushites is unclear. The elephant is depicted in Kushite art. At Masawara, as Sufra, reliefs of elephants are common. One of these shows a king riding an elephant. On the northwest wall of the Lion Temple, a file of elephants leads prisoners on the ropes. Incidentally, there are reliefs that depict processions where people are shown riding two-wheeled horse-drawn chariots. The Kushites maintained a keen interest in the political developments in Egypt, their northern neighbor. Upper Egypt revolted against the rule of the Greeks in 204 BC. Though reconquered in 185 BC, Lower Nubia fell into the hands of Kush. Pharaohs Archimani II and Adikalami built monuments in Dhaka, Dabad, and Philae. In around the 1st century BC, the Upper Egyptians again revolted amongst the Greek rulers. The Kushites offered their support. There were also armed campaigns against the Romans in 24 BC. The Roman conquest of Egypt in 30 BC brought a new challenge to Kush. Augustus Caesar threatened an invasion following his Egyptian campaign. According to Strabo, the famous geographer, sometime between 29 and 24 BC, the conflict with Kush began. Queen Mother Amenerus, the Kushite ruler, gave the order to march into Egypt and attack the invaders. Akindad led the campaigns against the Roman armies of Augustus. The Kushites sacked Aswan with an army of 30,000 men, and they destroyed the statues of Caesar, the Elephantine. The Romans under Petronius counterattacked. Though described as a strong and fortified city, they captured Caesarea Brim in 23 BC after their first assault. The Romans invaded as far as Napata and sacked it through Amarenus, evaded their clutches. Petronius returned to Alexandria with prisoners 
and booty, leaving behind a garrison in Lower Nubia. Amarenes ordered her armies to march a second time with the aim of seizing the Roman garrison. This time, however, a standoff with Petronius was reached without fighting. The Roman army retired to Egypt and withdrew their fort, declaring Pax Romana, i.e. peace. In fact, the full extent of the Roman humiliation has yet to be disclosed since the relevant Kushite account of the affair has yet to be published. The Meroitic account of this encounter cannot yet be fully understood. Pharaoh Nata Kamani and Queen Amatore were the last great builders of Kush. They lived somewhere around 1 AD to 20 AD. Their buildings were raised in Karaba, an area between the Nile and the Atbara rivers. Moreover, they built monuments in Naka. In this city, the Temple of Epidemac, one of their best-known monuments, is in good state of preservation. Naka also contains a famous kiosk. This temple mixes architectural motifs from Nile Valley, Roman, and Greek influences. See page 25. The royal palace of Natakamani and Queen Amatore was in Gebel Barkel. Finally, they dug reservoirs around Meroe, restored its huge temple of Amun, and rebuilt the Amun Temple of Napata, previously destroyed by Romans. The period of decline dates from 200 AD. Hungry nomads from the desert obstructed vital trade routes and also infiltrated the country. A more important challenge came from the Kingdom of Aksum located in present-day regions of Eritrea and Ethiopia. Under King Ezana, their armies marched on Kush in 350 AD. They destroyed the towns of masonry and cotton fields and also seized a vast amount of livestock. After a brilliant 1,000 years, the Kushite state collapsed. This ended the 6,000-year cycle of pharaonic culture. We give the final word on this topic to Mr. George Wells Parker, who wrote a moving dedication to the Nile Valley legacy. For thousands of years, Egypt dwelt happily in the valley of the Nile, till her warriors crossed the Emerald Mountains with sword in hand, inviting luxury, decay, and death, and though these inevitable human consequences came, as they must always come, Horus has never ceased his vigil. Egypt has lived and played her part in the human wonder drama, but I believe that the memory that we have of her may hold one lesson among the many, and that is there have been and are great potentialities in the race which gave Egypt to the sum of human things. Perhaps that Hebrew sage was truly inspired when he told how in the days to come the children of Ethiopia, i.e. Nubia slash Cush, and Egypt should again stretch forth their hands and bring back to their immortal race the glory which lies sleeping and forgotten.